Well, hello, Crossroads. Great to be with you again for another time in God's Word, being encouraged and strengthened and built up in the faith. Uh, I was looking today. This is our 64th installment of our Unmoved series, which began well over a year ago, just uh, to encourage our church family and beyond through this crazy COVID time that we've been in. And we've really loved being with you at these midweeks, and I hope that you've loved it too. Uh, uh, a number of weeks ago, probably, I don't know, it must have been 10 or 12 now, uh, we peeled off and kind of did a series within a series and took on the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, where uh, the writer of Hebrews just sets forth case after case after case from Old Testament saints that have gone on before us, that lived in a faith that was well-pleasing to God. And we are looking to each of those to get an idea of what faith really, what biblical faith really looks like when it's operating in a believer's life. And I've been so encouraged by it. Today's a big week. We're going to wrap up Hebrews 11. Uh, and then... Uh, today, and I'm going to do it in two verses here to, to wrap us up. So let me pray over our time in the Word right now, and let's get to it, shall we? Father, we thank you for another blessed opportunity to open the Word of God, to receive it with such gladness in our hearts, and to experience the power of your living Word sanctifying our life and changing us from glory to glory to glory. In all of it, Lord, we pray that, that in the deep place of our lives, you'll be building hearts of true faith that know how to stand for you and know how to live for you in the current days that we're in. Do that even now, Lord, by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I know this sounds weird, but I'm going to wrap up Hebrews 11 with a couple of verses from Hebrews chapter 12. Because the thought that we've been in, all of these real-life narratives of men and women from the Old Testament that manifested a deep and abiding faith in God, again, we're just learning what it looks like to walk and live in faith. Um, uh, the storyline and, and the point continues on right into chapter 12. It's connected with the word, therefore, so there probably shouldn't even be a chapter break here in our Bibles. It should, the thought is ongoing. And, and these two verses, I was talking to Pastor Joe recently, and we all just laughed about it, that I, I don't know how you read these, and these aren't a couple of our favorite verses in Scripture. He and I both felt like, and I've probably taught through these two verses many, many occasions, dozens maybe, and they remain two really favorites for me, and I, and I read them, and I'm encouraged and strengthened by them every single time, and learn something new from them every single time. So here we go. Let me read our text, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, and that word connects it to all those stories. So he's, he's, it's as if he's saying, I said all that to say this. Here is our response, in other words. Here is the, the, under, the, the appropriate response to rehearsing all of these cases of great faith in the Old Testament. Here's what it should do to us, and here should be our response. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance, the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, what a rich couple verses. The Bible does an interesting thing. It uses every possible literary form to help us understand and get our minds, our small and infinite minds, in relationship to uh, an all-wise, perfect God. 
Uh, the Bible uses these different literary forms to help us understand the deep things of God. Throughout the Bible, there's poetry and songs. There's narrative. There's doctrinal declarations. There's metaphors and, and word pictures that are drawn uh, as these human authors, inspired by the Holy Spirit, would put to pen to paper and help us understand the things of God. So that's what you have here. I love these metaphors. They, they just help us so much. Uh, throughout the, the Bible, let me just remind us or, or refresh us on a number of these metaphors. The Christian life, uh, according to Scripture, is like, that's what a metaphor does, this is like that. The Christian life is like a warfare. It's a battle. And that metaphor is drawn on a lot by many authors that, 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 that being a Christian puts us smack dab in the middle of a great cosmic spiritual battle. The Christian then in this world is seen throughout the Bible as a pilgrim, that's a metaphor, a stranger, a passer through. Paul referred to himself as a slave. He called it a bond servant. It's translated often in the, in the English translation. Uh, it, but it really just means slave. He was a slave to Christ. And he draws on what slavery looked like in the ancient times. He draws ideas about what it is to be connected to Christ and to be in relationship with him where he's master and we're his servant. And, and so there's a bit of a metaphor a word picture for us there. Jesus uh, referred to his people in the world as salt. That's a metaphor. Salt purified things. Salt gave flavor to things. He referred to us as salt and light. There's another great metaphor for who we are in the world and how we're to see ourselves as gifts to the world as we walk in light and become light to the world. Paul loved athletic metaphors, boxing, as he talked about buffeting our flesh. Um, he used the metaphor of runners in a race, as he does here in our text. There are construction metaphors throughout the Bible as well. We are a building. Each one of you and me is a living stone placed in this great structure being built for a habitation of God in the Spirit. Do you see all the metaphors? They help us understand what it means to be a Christian, what it means to have a walk with the living God. Our verses today give us a big word picture to help us understand how we should approach our walk with Him. Uh, the writer has just laid out this long list of spiritual giants of the faith, and now he talks about us being surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. And there's no doubt in my mind that he's drawing a picture of the um, Athenian games there, the Olympic games, where crowds would gather to watch men running their race. And I think he's drawing on that common experience to help us understand that, that this walk of faith uh, is motivated by understanding that those have gone before us who also walked in faith, somehow we're surrounded by their great witness and should, that should provide great motivation for us. So let's break this down and unpack it a little bit and see what the Lord has for us. I think the key reference here, the key wording here, therefore we also, verse 1, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, uh, lay aside every weight and sin, that so easily ensnares us, and here it is. Let us run with endurance. There's the exhortation. May our life of faith be an enduring race, one that we actually finish and run all the way to the end. I think this word endurance is such a powerful word, such an important word. Uh, I, I, let me say it in a declared form here that saving faith is also enduring faith. A faith that does not last, then, was never saving faith in the first place. Saving faith is, according to the Bible, 
faith that endures all the way to the end. It doesn't mean it doesn't have rough spots. It doesn't mean that it doesn't at times wax colder than other times or thinner than other times. But it will endure a man all the way to the end, or it is not saving faith. Listen to just a few passages here that help us understand how important the component of endurance is to the faith that really pleases God. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 22, uh, we read, And you will be hated by all for my sake, Jesus says, but he who endures to the end will be saved. He who endures to the end will be saved. What a statement. That, that says a lot, doesn't it? Doesn't that tell us that saving faith equals enduring faith, or that enduring faith is the faith that truly brings one into a saved relationship with God? The faith that does not endure simply isn't saving faith. 2 Timothy 2.10, Therefore I endure all things, Paul writes, for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. And this is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Again, an exhortation to enduring faith. You can just both through the text today, these passages I'm reading in support of that text, what they summon us to, they, you can feel the Lord calling us to be reminded that, that the faith that pleases God, the saving faith, is enduring faith. Are you enduring today? Are you steadfast in faith? Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 16. The words of Jesus. These likewise, he's talking about the parable, we're talking about the parable of the seeds and the soils here. And he ex finally explains each condition of soil and why some grows to maturity and some doesn't. And in that explanation in Mark 4, verse 16, Jesus says, And likewise, these are the, this is the seed sown on stony ground, who when they hear the word, they immediately receive it with gladness. So there's an immediate response of faith immediate response to the gospel, an immediate response to the love of God through Christ, and they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Their response to, to the gospel is not enduring faith. Afterwards, when tribulation and persecution arise, for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Their faith is isn't a saving faith, it's not an enduring faith, and so somewhere in the process of life becoming difficult, becoming challenging, they bug out, they walk away, they defect. That's not enduring faith. That's not saving faith. Right here, earlier in the book of Hebrews, it was written in chapter 3, verse 14, for we have become partakers of Christ if we and there's a big if. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast in the end. If we hold our confidence, that's faith, in the work of Christ, steadfast to the end. Saving faith is enduring faith. I think that's key to understanding then what we're, we're going to read in our text in the rest of verse 1 and in verse 2. He's now explaining and he's expounding on what enduring faith looks like or the components. It's almost like he, he calls for enduring faith as we read that long list in chapter 11. He says, look, this is the message. Run your race with endurance. And then he tells us how to do that. And it's like the Holy Spirit just counsels us. And I'm, and I'm, I'm going to draw on six things out of the text, that make up enduring faith. They're like, like clues of how to walk in truly a faith that will take me into the end of my race, that will endure all the way to the end. So here we go, six things. Number one, 
He says, consider, or since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside. So he, his first point seems to be that, that let there be motivation in the thought that others have gone before you who probably suffered far more than you or I in our cushy little American lives will ever suffer. Be motivated by that. Take a minute and understand that, that men and women endured far more troubles than you or I probably ever will, and they did it faithfully serving Jesus. That's that great cloud of witnesses that have gone before us. Recently, Charlene and I were, were watching a documentary on television on Corey Ten Boom. Uh, many of you have heard of her. She was a, a dear saint who in her 50s, when Germany invaded her country, um, she, her family, led by her dear father, who was a powerful saint and a wonderful man of God, quiet, but reserved in his love for Jesus and um, uh, just a powerful man of faith, he sat down with his family and he guided them to an understanding that this is our duty in this day. We're going to subject ourselves to great danger by helping and aiding uh, the Jews. And they did that. They built a room uh, in their house. They, they changed some walls and created something they called the hiding place. And they would hide as many as six or eight people in there and, and all which was illegal and put their lives at great risk. Eventually, they were betrayed. And they were arrested, the whole family, taken out of their home. Um, though they were not Jewish, they had aided the Jews, and they were sent to camps. Within only a few short months, their father died. The treatment was so brutal. He was in his 80s, and he passed away within only months. Um, after a longer period of time, uh, Corey was very close to her sister, and her sister took abuse of a treatment throughout the camps. For some reason, they picked on her. One particular guard uh, was brutal towards Corey's sister. She eventually succumbed and also died while imprisoned. Corey um, survived, and uh, in a miraculous way, uh, her number came up, and she was eventually released, and she survived after years of incarceration, and she ended up spending the rest of her life serving the Lord, and wherever her story would be heard, she shared of the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God that allowed her and caused her to endure through all that suffering. And Shari and I were left with the thought that, you know, we've endured so little for the sake of Christ. There was this, you could feel between her and I, this humble prayer kind of rising up in her heart that, Lord, no matter what we face, others have, faith, has, have, faith, have faced so much worse. Lord, help us endure in an abounding faith our whole life long. So that's what he's talking about, is motivation that comes from just taking a minute. And no matter what trouble you may be in or what troubling times you feel that you might be in right now, dear ones, there are people that have endured far more than you ever will for the sake of Christ. May your faith in mine always be enduring faith. He then says, lay aside. Lay aside. Interesting word. It's a compound Greek word made of two words, and they stick them together. The first compound is off or away. That's all it means, is off or away. The second of the compound word connected to it is to place or to set or to put. So he says, lay aside means to purposefully and intentionally set or place or put something off of you, away from you. And what does he say to lay aside? Lay aside two things, every weight and every sin. There's a big difference between these two. Don't know if you've ever thought about it, but one, I think we understand, to lay aside every sin. 
A sin would be anything we do or attitudes we harbor or conditions of heart that we entertain that do damage to us and, and grieve the heart of our Father. Their behaviors or attitudes that damage His eternal work in our life they do harm to us and other people, and they grieve the heart of God. I think we all have a pretty good handle on what sin is. These are the things, he's saying, lay aside those things that we do or attitudes we harbor that grieve God, lay them aside. Place them off you. Take them off. And this is a common exhortation in Scripture, is it? To take off the old man, to put on the new man. There's some responsibility that we have in this day right now, as it is, a challenging season of time for all of us, to lay aside, put off, take and place away from us those behaviors and attitudes that do us harm, do our faith harm, and that grieve the heart of our Father. So let's do that. Let's, let's having read of these great saints of old, let's let that be our response. In Jesus' name, May I take off, set aside the things that do me harm and that grieve the heart of God. Number two, he mentions weights. Well, weights are different than sins. Sins are what we do to ourselves. Weights are the things that happen to us. The burdens we bear, the difficult things in life that we aren't responsible for. I didn't do anything to deserve anything. This trouble just found me. COVID is like a weight. It's not connected to my sin or your sin. It's because we live in a broken world. We live in a world that rejected God and went its own way and is now reaping the whirlwind of its rejection of God. And this world is broken in so many ways. And this time that we're in is a weight. It's a trouble that found you and it found me. It found the world. But it's not connected to something you did or I did. But it's still a burden. It's still hard. It's still a challenge, isn't it? We're to lay aside even that. To determine, take off of us this sense that, that it will defeat me. That that it will overcome me or overwhelm me, that this is overwhelming, that it is a mountain too high to climb, that it's trouble too big to overcome. Take that and lay it off. Even the weights that so easily bind us up, get our eyes off Jesus, get us feeling uh, bound up in self-pity and, and all of that, cause us to, to wring our hands and, and become thin in faith. He says, take all that off. Whether it's a sin or a weight, something you've done to yourself, some sin of the past, or even right now in your life, or just the weightiness of this time, set it off, put it away, get your eyes on Jesus, is what, is what he's going to say here right now. So we have three things or four things here already. Number one, consider those who have gone before us and what they've endured. Number two, get active in laying aside some stuff. Number one, the weight Number two, the sin that so easily ensnares us. So there's some really call to action there, isn't there? And then he says, and run the race that's been set before you. I like that. Run the race that's been set before you. It's your race. You can't run mine. <laughs> and I can't run yours for you. Nobody can. There's a race that's been set before you, a, a challenge. It's very different than mine. It looks different. It feels different. It has a whole different set of circumstances to it. But it's yours to run. The best each man can do is to run their own race with endurance. Some races, I know, feel harder than others. Some are filled with more obstacles higher things to overcome, deeper valleys to traverse. And, but it's their race to run, and you have yours. Take that challenge on today, dear one. This is what the Lord is calling and summoning us to this morning. Having looked at that great list of chapter 11, 
Over many weeks we studied it. Now it's time to respond. Take on the race that God has set before you. It's been set before you. God's hand is in it. It will not overcome you. It will not overthrow you. Run your race with endurance. And then he says this, and this is probably the most important of all in verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Looking unto Jesus. It's time now to get our eyes off of what's going on around us. Get our focus off of the troubles of the day. Get our focus off of even ourselves. And set our gaze squarely upon Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. This looking upon Jesus is not just a casual gaze sent his way. This word is a big word. It's not a glance. The Lord gave me a picture of this one time. I was trying to get my head around what, it, what, he's made, what he means here. Looking unto Jesus. What does that mean? It's intense. Um, and the Lord gave me a picture of the birth of our first child, Micah. When Charlene was in the throes of labor, uh, Lamaze Lamaz was in vogue at the time, and that was a technique where I helped and was very involved in the birth and was helping Charlene breathe through contractions. Uh, we, we, I say we, my wife birthed all three of our kids unmedicated, and, and it was intense, frighteningly intense. <laughs> Scared me to death, to be quite frank. But, but right in the middle of it, at, at its craziest point this, in this labor, Charlene would want me right in her face, breathing with her, and, and, and taking these shallow breaths through the worst of the contraction, locked onto her eyes. We were inches away from each other. If I got further away from that, she began to panic. And, and so it was so intense, and I could see in her eyes this desperation for me to stay engaged, to lock onto her. And to be there for her that intensely, breathing and going through it with her. This is what I believe he's talking about. Intensely fix your eyes upon Jesus with desperation right now. Lord, I need you. You're everything to me. I find in you. To look upon him means to find in him all of our hope, all of our strength, all of our peace, all power we need to walk in an overcoming faith. Fixing our eyes on Jesus is not a casual glance for a little bit on a Sunday morning or picking up your Bible for three minutes out of guilt on a Tuesday night. Looking unto Jesus is a, a grabbing a hold of Him and gazing upon Him and, and intensely bringing Him into the focus of your life and my life. Let's do that. Let's look upon Jesus in this day. This is our response to what it means to walk in a biblical faith. We must bring Jesus into focus and look intensely to Him in faith. Looking unto Jesus. I thought about it again. There's also a tenderness to this. Intense looking upon Jesus. I, I remember when our children each were born. Still today when I get near a newborn, um, they have a way of looking at you. Have you I know you've experienced this, where a, a little helpless child, a, a, an infant, a newborn, and they look at your eyes, and they lock onto your face, and they stare at you. They just, their face can be expressionless, they just, they just stare at you. And I, there's something beautiful in that. I wish I, I knew what was going through the heart of a, of a newborn as they're studying the one will, that will take care of them, a parent that will take care of them their whole life, that will guard them, guide them, supply their needs, love them, desperately love them. There's something about fixing our eyes on Jesus that is like a helpless child that brings their parent in focus and just sets their gaze upon the one that will love you your whole life, care for you your whole life, 
supply all your needs according to his riches and glory your whole life long. This is the faith that pleases God. The one that runs with endurance. It finishes the race all the way to the end by fixing its eyes on Jesus, by laying aside both the weights, the heaviness of what happens to us, as well as the sins, the things we do to ourselves, Lay all of it aside today, right now, and trust Him for the rest of your life. And certainly for this day that we're in, as you do, dear ones, I know that He will be found utterly faithful to His high purpose in your life and mine. So there we have a quick conclusion to a long chapter 11. Therefore, this is our response. Let us lay it all aside, bring Jesus firmly into focus, and endure all the way to the end. Praise the Lord. Well, God bless you. Thanks for for studying with us. It's so good to be with you in these midweeks. We look forward to traveling through 1 John with you over the next four weeks. God bless you now. Let me close our time in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and the, the richness of our text tonight, these, just these two simple verses, they call us to a response. They, they almost demand a response. And so, Lord, as we respond, we say, help us, O God. Cause us by the work of your Spirit to endure in an abiding faith all the way to the end. We're going to do it by keeping you in focus, by making it all about you by being motivated by that cloud of witnesses that is enduring more than us, has gone on before us, by laying aside every sin and every weight that ensnares us, we're going to fix our eyes on you and endure. Oh, we love you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for each other. Thank you for your presence tonight. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, God bless you, family. Wrapping up Hebrews 11. Can't wait to study 1 John with you. God bless you tonight. Go in His love.